Sponsor. All right, thanks everybody for being here tonight. We're got a nice meeting. Budget meeting is on the nursing home. We have Executive Director Larry Slatke here and Commissioner Management and Budget or Budget, whatever you, what do you prefer? Commissioner? It's Sean. Sean Thielen. <laughs> so, a little bit unusual. I think the first time that we're, we're having two committees, um, uh, one of our standing committees, the Elder Committee is uh, joining us, uh, the Audit and Finance Committee, for this meeting tonight. Uh, Wanda Willingham is joining us as the chair of that committee and also as the vice chair of the legislature. Um, why don't we have uh, members of the committees introduce themselves, starting with Chris on Audit and Finance. Uh, Chris Fragans, 5th District. Uh, Paul Bergdorf, 23rd Colony. Ray Joyce, 13th. Bill Clay, 12th. Joe O'Brien, uh, Colony. Mark Grimm, Vice Chair of Finance. Charlie Dawson, Glenmont and Delmar. I'm going to chair of the Health Care, 3rd Ledge. Rick Touche, 37th District, Queens. Frank Camisildo, 11th. Lucille McKnight, legislated first. So I'd like to uh, turn over the first set of questions to our chair of the Elder Care Committee, uh, Wanda Willingham, for, for Larry. And then, uh, I'll be popping in with some questions and then we'll have members join in with some questions as well. So, okay. thank you so much. If, if you're, I could ask you if you're still yeah, I'm, I'm not okay. So, Larry, let me just uh, jump in here while Wanda gets some of her notes together. Um, based on the uh, written responses we got from you in your memo um, yesterday, uh, the first goal you said for 2019 is completing renovation and new construction for D, E, and F residential units. Right. So where are we today in terms of achieving this goal in terms of time and, and budget? Well, we started... So we're starting off with the construction side of things rather than the operating budget. Okay. We started uh, shoveling ground in August of this year. Uh, we're making great progress in D, E, and F. Uh, right now, I was in those units uh, yesterday, and they are totally gutted. So okay. it's amazing what they look like and how large the space is. Uh, the outdoor uh, area uh, almost leveled, and we're getting ready probably within a week and a half to pour some of the footings, to get the footings in hopefully before winter. Uh, and we're starting working uh, extra shifts. This is, we just got this memo today from Gerson, because they are by themselves, and they don't disturb the resident population when they work over there at the EF, working additional hours, and they're going to start constructing uh, the new wings within the EF. So I think if everything goes the way it's going right now, and there's nothing unforeseen, and hopefully there won't be, because we're renovating versus building new, and we know everything that's there and that exists. Hopefully, this summer of next year, DE and F will be open. Next summer? That's right. I'm hoping somewhere July of 2019. July of, okay. Hopefully, DE and F will open, and that's very important to us because without DE and F open, we cannot maintain our total census of 250. And uh, it also gives us challenges in the existing building, providing services in the uh, nursing home that is undersized for the type of service that we provide. So this hopefully will open the door for new admissions, um, more acutely ill residents that we can care for because of the space alone. Okay. Do you want to follow up on that? Yes. So, so why don't you get to July, then what happens? If we can open up DE and F in July, or it's going to be around July, mm -hmm. then we will move the residents who are at A and D over to DE and F. And then you can start. And I should also point out that this week we moved everyone from the north side of the first floor into other spaces within the nursing home, including doubling up offices on the south side of the first floor. We're going to seal off um, that area by Monday of next week, and they're going to start gutting the entire 
north section of the first floor, which is the education areas, the clinic areas, the, some of the staff areas. And that ties into DE and F. So that is a nine month project. So we're hoping that the north wing first floor will be completed by the summer of uh, next year as along with DE and F. And then all of that area will be open and then we'll switch everyone who's in the south side of the building will go to the north side of the building. We will close off the front of the building and the south side and they'll already be working hopefully on uh, A, B, and C. And we do have staff members on C now. Medical records is there, finance over there. Uh, those staff members will have to be moved. So what's the census right now? Right now around 200, 198, 205. We have around six people in the hospital today, so we're around two, in the in-house 202 this morning. So you have enough beds to switch people around? Right now we could go up to probably comfortably 220 using the high-rise, because the high-rise is totally open. And we're not going to empty out so the high-rise. You have some slack to move people around while you're there. Okay. Plenty. We have literally, according to the census and, and our license capacity, we have approximately 45 empty beds. Yeah. You, I'm sorry. But it's still on the census. Yeah. Still on the census. Can you um, can you tell me um, is there what's what is the census census for the rehab care versus people that that are in there? Well, I don't know how many people are in rehab today. Um, it, it varies from from day to day. There's maintenance people who are on rehab, and then there's those that are on Medicare rehab, which is five day week rehab. Normally, the census can range anywhere between 25 to 30, all in, in therapy. Okay, that, and that's temporary? That, that's no, that, that hopefully, that's a, hopefully that census, once we're filled, would, would grow substantially. Yeah. That's what it is right now as we speak today. And, and so, so how many license beds do we have right now? You said two, 220? 250. 250, okay, we, we have 250. And so those beds, those license beds, will be maintained during the renovation stage? Oh, yeah, we're not giving up any of our license beds. If we could fill every available bed today, most likely we could get a census maybe 220 tops 225. We couldn't go above 225. Uh, understanding some of the residents that are in semi-private rooms would really need to be in a private room. So following up on that, you had mentioned in the... Um this memo that your success is going to be measured against the daily census, which we've just been talking about, which is a little 198, 200 right now, right. and the case mix, so like rehab and medical. We just mentioned some of those. So, can you can you elaborate on that? Like, well, I believe that you know residents have a choice today. Well, they always have had a choice, but they they clearly have a, a choice of where they want to live when they need nursing home care. If our building is renovated, which it will be, then it is my belief that our census will increase uh, due to our location and to the environment in which residents will be able to live in. And our goal, once the total renovation is done, we can possibly wait for that. Once we have 120 new renovated beds, that the census hopefully will average between 230 to 40. Uh, that would be our goal, you know, sometime toward the latter part of 2019. That would automatically, as far as I'm concerned, increase the case mix because we're going to be admitting residents who are more acutely ill and need long-term care. And um, our daily census, therefore, would go up dramatically, increasing revenue on both sides of the fence. The case mix as well as daily census, which is how we get paid. Gotcha. So, just a couple. I'm gonna I got a couple of members ask questions. Um, I just want to follow up on. Um, so, so what is your target date to be complete? Our goal. Would July be, is the first step. Right. I'll say, our goal is year. September 2020. We still need to do, as I mentioned, the south side, A, B, and C, and the entire basement. Okay. Um, we have a couple. I have a couple more capital questions too. But let, Mr. Bergdorf had a question. Um, and then yeah, it was sort of census related as well. Um, when you talk about uh, being the new section being open for business in July, and we're at 198 205 now, how do you see the census progressing as you go through the construction and the and the transfer phase? 
uh, between now and July. Is it are, is it a deterrent for people to come there during a new people to come during the construction process, or is it something that you actively market because people know that come July there's going to be a new state of the art nursing home? And well, I think it's kind of all of the above. Right now, um, we are challenged <coughs> for certain resident populations needing the care that they require in our nursing home. Uh, once DE and F open, that's going to give us 100, approximately 120 totally renovated beds. Out of those 120, we will have 60 private rooms, and the other will be by axle rooms. Sit in double bedded rooms, but by axle rooms, so it'll be like a private room. It's called double bedded rooms because they share a toilet and a shower. And I believe that when we move over, the residents and we'll decide which residents come over from two through five units or A and B units. So some of the A and B unit residents will go upstairs and then some will go over to D and F. We probably will have around 40 to 50, uh, at least 40 to 50 empty beds. And that is the area that we will market new residents to. And then once the A, B and C are done, uh, the rest of the residents in the high rise will come down to those units uh, as well as part of the E and F. Is there actually a marketing plan? How do you go about marketing? Well, uh, we did uh, request and receive approval from the legislature uh, to retain a marketing rebranding company who is now on board. We've been working with them for the last uh, three weeks. Uh, we have a plan to do that from websites to uh, brochures. I, I believe that once people see this new nursing home, uh, it's going to sell itself. I don't know that you need a lot of media to take place after the fact in true advertising. I think nursing homes are filled uh, for two reasons. Number one, quality of care. You have to have quality of care. And number two, environment. And both of those are probably equal. Quality of care and environment are why people come to nursing homes today. And I believe we're going to offer both. Okay. Chris, you set and then got So, do you have a question too, Frank? I, I just want to touch on this census number, getting back to it. I, I appreciate the fact that you're going to market the facility. Right now, there is no wait. If somebody wanted a bed, we could accommodate that. Yes. Up to how many people? We probably could accommodate right now around 20 additional people. It, and why do you think, I mean, once upon a time, I've been here a while now, there was a major wait to get into the nursing home. Why is that changing? Why is that changed? Well, we're not competitive with the, our environment. If anyone could take a tour, I'd be more than happy to get But yeah, I've toured the facility, <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, it's very clear. If you could go to a nursing home that's been renovated or at least maintained, even though it was built 30 years ago, but maintained uh, or have proper sizing for the care that you're a relative or a friend may need, uh, they're going to go to those facilities versus our nursing home. So just one hypothetical for you. We, we finish with the construction, get 10 or 15 more beds filled on a daily <coughs> recurring basis, but we still have this huge, you know, ability to take another 30 people, 40 people. I mean, that's money we're not generating, right, to pay back the bonds on the facility? Oh, definitely. That's true. So, I mean... I appreciate your confidence in it, but I'm interested to know, like, what happens if we get to that situation? Well, again, I are we shit out a lot? But that, I uh, really believe. Otherwise, I would have recommended it. I'm going to be there. I mean, I voted for it, so yeah, I yeah, uh, I I'm a firm believer uh, that this nursing home people want to come to. People have a true loyalty to Albany County and to this nursing home. And the fact that we're able, to, with our environment, be able to maintain a census of 200, 205, and that only went down over the last uh, year, maybe a little over a year, we were actually averaging 220. Sure. <coughs> um, and we're declining mainly because the environment keeps declining. You know, even though we're renovating now, and we uh, put forth a lot of dollars towards this project, uh, we didn't renovate anything yet. That people are living in. We're still living the in a nursing home that was built in 1971 and hasn't really been touched in around 20 years. 
Okay. So that, I think, is the major problem. When people see what this nursing home is going to look like in the six communities that we're building for people to live in, in Albany, in our community, I believe people are going to really be knocking down your doors to get into this place. Yeah, I think and next year. I have you exercise Chairman's prerogative here to ask another question. So what census um, are you using to base the 2019 budget? Well, the 2019 budget was, I, I went away from the census actually. Okay. I believe it became like a fake number. And so the first four That's years, honest. I guess I was there. When I mean a fake number, meaning you're creating a, 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 a census based on filling nursing home beds on a daily basis and what do you believe to be the average. When I realized around a, two years ago, around a year and a half ago, and that was last year's budget and this year's budget, that the census was declining. I didn't want to create a census based on, meaning revenue, based on census base. So I based it on the previous year's revenue, okay, and what I believe the revenue was going to be versus a census number. So I didn't, even though it's listed, it's based on what we received the year before, what we believe the IGT is going to be, and what we believe the census is going to be based on revenue. Now we have increased revenue. Our Medicaid went up, our capital went up, our Medicare went up. All of our revenues went up over the last three years. And even though the census has gone down, our revenue has gone up by millions of dollars. Yeah, I, one of the reasons I ask, if it, you have a, a patient census, you build your staffing around that and a lot of your, your costs. You, Correct. Theoretically, and, that's, and, and, and over the last, since 2012, the difference between what we appropriate and what you actually spend is pretty substantial. It has been consistently <coughs> substantial. Yeah, we, we constantly request in our budget the full amount of staffing required for a 250-bed nursing home because we don't know where that census is going to go and when it's So you're budgeting go. for the, quote, best case scenario in a way. 100% true. But right. we right. monitor, and I monitor, this, the census to staffing every single day. And as you can see, even though we would like to have some of the openings filled that are on some of these other pages that are, that are not filled, some of them are not filled because I don't fill them because I know what our census is. Um, so, we still want you to jump in here now. We're going to get back to the IGT, which you brought up, okay. and the vacancies. Larry, uh, what determines uh, uh, a, a patient uh, uh, receiving a private or semi-private room? How do you determine that? What is that based on? Well, there's two, there's really two primary ways we, we determine who goes into a private room. Num the number one is a private pay patient. If you're a private pay patient and you want a private room, pay for a private room because there is a difference to a semi-private pricing versus a private pricing, you would, uh, you would get a private room. If you have a behavior that is uh, difficult for other residents or families to live with you in a shared room, you will probably end up in a private room as well. Those are the two primary reasons. And other than that, it's you know where you end up by the admissions, the care that you may need. Uh, even though we don't have ventilators, but as an example, <coughs> if you had a ventilator, we're not going to put you in a semi-private room because the space that would be needed for you, as an example. But one of the beautiful parts about this project is we're going to have approximately 135 private rooms. Every single existing double bedded room today in the nursing room on the first floor is going to be a private room. And no one is going to have that in the space that we're creating it along with the biaxial rooms. There are, like Doors of Sarah, they do have all private rooms. But it's, it's, a, it's double the square footage to get there, to clean it, to maintain it, to service it. Half of our rooms are going to be by accident and we're all on one side of the house, the new side of the house. And being built in a way that the square footage is consistent with what a resident would need as if they were in a private room. But it will be the double bedded room, but by accident, and we're all separating the two residents. So you'll have total privacy. And so almost every room is going to be like a private room. The only difference is you're going to be sharing a shower and a toilet and a sink. Where the private rooms, they're not going to share. 
Commissioner, why are you looking at me? Sorry, you asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to follow up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Bill, Bill, are you finished, Bill? Yeah. Based on the question that Bill just asked in regards to private rooms, can you tell me the difference between how uh, uh, Medicaid versus Medicare versus private insurance and how that affects the, um, uh, you know, the, the budget and the revenue as far as the nursing home is concerned? Well, Medicare is the highest payer of any source. And that is because the theory is that when you're a Medicare resident, you're going to need acute care services that are beyond long-term care, meaning it's for a short stay. Medicare is only 20 days free, meaning, and I don't say free, but where is the no COVID insurance, I should say, not free, but no COVID insurance. But the 21st day to the 100th day is a COVID insurance and Medicare pays the balance. On the 101st day, you not need to have another payer source. Medicare no longer pays after 100 days. Now, under the new system of reimbursement, which is going into effect October 1st of next year, there's no longer going to be where therapy drives Medicare, which that's what it does right now. If you have a lot of therapy minutes in Medicare, you will receive additional reimbursement, significant initial uh, reimbursement for the rehab services being provided. Under the new system of Medicare, starting October 1st, that's no longer going to be the case. When you come in, they're going to pay by the, modal the modalities being given to you, not necessarily the therapy. Therapy is one of the modalities, and that's why I've already transitioned. We began our staff, we all are transitioning to that new system. And if you um, Remember, I did come to the legislature and started to convert our activity titles to certified nursing assistant titles because all of the work that's done by certified nursing assistants is captured through modality where activity people providing the service cannot be captured because they're not certified in our facility anyway. So we're already started to make the transition. Now, Medicaid is the payer of less resource, so traditionally they're going to be the lowest payer of all payers. Um, and now our Medicaid rate will go up significantly with the capital plan because the capital plan gets reimbursed in the Medicaid process. So those are really the two primary payers. There, are, there is Medicaid managed care, there is Medicare managed care, but those are the real two private, you know, those are the real two primary payers. The other are private pays, and the difference is that they private, meaning Medicare is run out on the first day. They have a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. They have to spend down if they're going to be there long term to a specific dollar amount. And then they will apply for Medicaid and Medicaid will pick them up. Joe, you ready? Yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing is DE and F is going to be completed next July, roughly. That is the goal. We're, okay. we're, we're, on, we're on right now. We're on a path to open it up okay. in July. And then September 2020. Going to be phase two, like a better word, is going to be completed. Will you max out at that point to 250 beds? Yes, I believe, again, if we're successful and everything works the way the plan has been put together, the goal would be even though A, B, and C are still under renovation, we will have 120 brand new beds, okay, today's standard available to the public understanding that we have four units upstairs. The four units upstairs, okay, are 160 beds. So even if we move over, okay, let's say the 60, 70 residents over to D, E, and F, we still have 60 empty beds in a brand new wing. You don't have to ask anyone upstairs to move until we're done with A, B, and C. So the goal would be, as soon as A, D, and F are renovated, you know, let's see what the market is out there and once Could you provide the legislature, the chairman, or the majority leader, or minority leader, a monthly update on the progress of the construction so that we know that you're adhering to the timetables and the contractors adhering to the uh, timetable? We have a time schedule that we have put together, okay. and there are people at the meeting. Uh, we, you know, we do meet on a monthly basis with people here. I could give Kevin or whoever, whoever you would like me to give it to, you know, and I will get it to you. Yeah, well, I, I think it would be helpful for the 
for, for the members okay. to have a monthly update. All right. uh, so so following on Joe, so the new beds are done. What happens with all the, the rest of the space in the, in the building that's unimproved? It's not like four and five, which is not the sheriff's not going to go into now. And, and what, what, what do we have left that's well, going to be this, this is where no we are longer today. used? Okay, this is where we are today, to my knowledge. Right now, the nursing home will be occupied on the entire first floor with the new construction and renovation and all of the basements. The sheriff is taking over the Shaker Wing with an addition, which is basically separate from the nursing home, even though it's connected, it can't be separate, it's onto itself. The high rise, which is second, third, fourth, and fifth floor, is still yet to be determined. We've been having what we call restacking meetings to, and deciding what would be the best use for the county for that space. Any comments on that, Mr. Fisher? I think that, you know, multiple departments have been looked at. Maybe if there's service providers that to give them a point of presence, easier access out there that uh, could definitely benefit the community out there. Um, and, and we go from there. I mean, it's, it's an open discussion at this point. It's, we're two years away before, uh, you know, before we even start <coughs> breaking down, the, breaking down the, the current situation. Year and a half. Right? Larry, what's the projected cost of this operation? Of the total cost of the project? Mm -hmm. I'm saying somewhere around, somewhere north of around $70 million, $75 million. $70, $75 million. $70 million. <coughs> okay. Question two <coughs> is what is the operation what is the operation going into Western Avenue where the Ramada Inn was that they fully renovated which is several hundred units I know it's got some uh, daycare for seniors it's got several different components <coughs> that have to do with seniors Initially, I know it was going to be part nursing home. Are we looking at that when we're looking at these numbers where we say we're going to have 230, 235? Are we looking that there's competition that's pretty heavy by the looks of things? I believe <coughs> when this nursing home is completed, knowing that today you know, and how this nursing home uh, is to an outside person coming into it and be able to maintain a census of over 200 traditional uh, with probably a private census of over 15 to 16 people a day and a Medicare census that matches that. Um, I, I really truly believe that we are going to be the nursing home that people are going to want to live in. And I <coughs> don't worry about the other competitors. We're you providing don't worry quality about care it. in our environment. You We're going to be full. You don't worry about it. No. Uh, Chris and, and uh, wait a minute, Mr. Chairman, you, Vice Chair, you have a question? Yeah. And then we'll get to you, Chris, and Paul. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Red. We have, we've been climbing this hill of Reading for a long time. I think we started at 14 million, you said, Larry. Where are we exactly today and in 2019 with Reading, the imbalance of the nursing home, and how close are we to zero? Well, everything that really is in front of you is an estimate. You know, that's our target. It's a budget, and it's, a, and it's very fluid and it's constantly moving. Uh, I can tell you, looking at past years that have been certified financial statements, at least the last one that I have, shows approximately a little over $2 million in the red. I thought the 2017 said we were $20 million down. 2017? 2017 financial, that what just came out last week has us in. <coughs> Maybe this is a conversation we should have separately. Another question. You said your biggest challenge here is uh, these interrogatories was uh, the lack of professional paraprofessional, paraprofessional staff to fill the budget of vacant positions. That's with 200. Now, if we go to 250, isn't that even a more acute problem? How are we going to staff the nursing home, given that we're really struggling to staff 200? I believe that that is a more significant issue that we're going to have to deal with than building the nursing home. 
I don't believe building the nursing home is going to be a problem. I believe that there's not enough staff, okay, in general, to supply the need in the region of Albany for the amount of residents that need care. So what does that mean? People want to work in a quality nursing home. People want to work where they can get uh, a decent salary. And even though we give phenomenal benefits, no one gives benefits, we give people who really want a decent salary. And they want to work in an environment that's new, clean, okay, and that they have satisfaction in the place that they're working in. So I think that hopefully those things will draw people who work in other long-term care facilities or medical centers or other places in healthcare and Albany will come and work for us. We don't need a lot of people to fill the vacant positions. But if we fill them as the nursing home residents come to us, hopefully, and they both move simultaneously, um, hopefully everything will work out. But I'm telling you right now, this is a national problem, not, a, not an Albany problem or state problem. Is, I just got back from our national convention, the American Healthcare Association. Staffing throughout the United States, especially in long-term care, is a problem. And that we're all dealing with it nationally. The government is, the associations are. So what are you paying comparatively, kind of following up on Frank's question, in a way, for, for RNs and nursing assistants versus the people who are going to be working in the facility? What's the name of that one you were just talking about? You know, I don't know if it's called Premier or... I'm not sure. Uh, it's on Western Avenue. They finally put the sign up a few days ago. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so to, to a tr I mean, you say we're going to have a nice facility, we have good benefits, they want a salary too. What are you paying versus the competition? Right now, our, uh, and I'm going by the mean salaries of all day. I don't know what every nursing home uh, is paying because there's different salaries even within a title. But the average in Albany is a little over. $27,500 a year base pay for CNAs. Certified so nursing assistants, the average salary is $27,500. In our nursing home, the starting salary is $24,350. We're dealing with that issue right now at $1,199. We're in negotiations. We're trying to resolve it. Um, there are some differences of opinion of how it should be resolved. Uh, but we're working on it. When you talk about registered nurses, our LPNs, licensed practical nurses, are fine. We're in the ballpark there. However, our registered nurses, our starting salaries are around 54000 And I will tell you that RNs are not going to work at $54,000. It's just not going to do that. Most of the people who are RNs working for us, okay, have been here a while. When someone leaves, it's very difficult for us to fill those positions. I would say the starting salary and average there is probably more like 57, 58,000 to 62,000. And we are in full park with supervisors. Our supervisors make over $71,000 with our benefit structure. And not surprisingly, we haven't had a turnover in that position in the year, maybe over a year and a half by now. Yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris. Yeah, I just want to quickly follow up on that, Larry. So you're telling me that the fringe that's offered through the health insurance and uh, the retirement, that that is not adequate to bring us up to more of a level playing field with those nurses who don't get those benefits that work in the private sector? Correct. Really? Really. And, I, and, I, and I'll give you the reasons why. And it's very, very simple. When you're 28, 29 years old, that's the You're not thinking life. about retirement. Not thinking about retirement, not thinking about health. And Especially people millennials. People receive their health benefits through the emergency room for years. <coughs> sure. Now, the people who you will get is someone maybe, not to throw uh, age out there, but someone who is middle-aged, who raised, who probably didn't have a pension where they were, or not a good pension, realizes that they work around 10, 15 years for us, so they, they're there 45, 50 years old, they can get to retirement, and now they have the pension, they have the health, and now that you put those two things together, that's valuable. Sure. But there's not a lot of those people out there. That's interesting. Okay. Just, just, I mean, so I guess I, I think I need you to explain something to me. So we're paying less than the, uh, the private nursing homes. 
We're paying less than all nursing homes in the Golden region for the okay. CNAs. Uh, and right now I'm talking about um, if our employees <coughs> were paying them less. RNs? C uh, so CNAs employees. were about $3,000. Oh, we're about $3,000 less per year for CNAs. That's correct. So, so is that across the board as far as our employee pay? We're paying less? No. That's, not That's only. That is true for the newly hired people, which represent <coughs> approximately 40% of our workforce. We have we have CNAs that are making 33,000 a year. Those people are making the amount of money that they should be making being a certified nursing assistant in a nursing home. However, 40% of our workforce make $24,315 which is approximately $3,000 less per year than our competitors. Well, what's the issue with that? There's a huge disparity between the older staff and the younger. So what do you mean? So you're doing the same job after a year. You more or less have the same capabilities as, as the person working next to you. One's making $33,000 and one's making $24,000 to do the same job. So is that a union? Is that like collective bargaining situation or is that? Yes. And that's why yeah, I'm negotiating. So. And I'll be honest, we don't have a problem with 1199 SEIU. The problem is working with the staff and trying to get them to understand that we have to take care of this disparity. So clearly, the people on the lower end of the earning scale are not complaining. The people saying, why are they getting this dollar amount and we're not getting the same amount? Because you had come to us last meeting in the meeting before saying how some staff were willing to give up part of it they were they're trying to work with each other informally and we did that we know not not informally formally that was nicer that's the other union the professional union made a conscious decision over the next two years well all of 18 and 19 to give up part of their income these are the highly compensated people and to give it to those on the lower end of the pay scale so and that is not that is not happening with the current situation at our facility, and we're dealing with it and trying to, you know, we're negotiating. We're trying to get it done, and we're not negotiating with 1199. We're negotiating with our own staff to get this done. So let me just let me just ask you something then. So we we we, we could go up to um, we'll be up to 250 available at at some point. Okay. So uh, as far as the um, the average uh, census. In, in, in nursing homes around here, how do we uh, 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 shape up with, you know, let's say Doris and Sarah, or, you know, and the rest. Well, what's their census? Uh, uh, you know, what's the average? I really don't know. I know I can get that for you if you want it, because the associations maintain that information. Uh, I, I personally do not know the average census. Okay. So, so I, I, let, let me tell you where I'm leading up to then. Okay, so, so so we're at a what two million uh, dollar uh, deficit, which I guess is based upon if, if we're the paying, last audited statement showed that. Okay, so if we're paying forty percent of our staff lower than the average. Okay, so so what? Why? Okay, wait a minute. I'm assuming that everybody else is making profit. I guess maybe that might be wrong. That might be wrong. Okay. All right. But let me but let me just tell you that if forty just forty beds are filled that are not filled today, and again, we average two hundred and twenty beds for years. It's only been over the last year and a half that it's dropped to where it is today. Even if you increase by thirty residents a day, just ten more than we had for the past decade before two years ago, you will increase the revenue of this nursing home over four million dollars a year just with 30 residents. So are we maintaining enough staff on each ship to, for, for, each, for um, our, our, our residents? Today, we get done what we need to get done. It's been a challenge. And that's why, if you notice in my report, the overtime continues to grow. Because the only way that we can service our resident population is having the people who work for us receive pay meaning overtime hours, and then over the additional pay. Yeah, I mean, in your, your, your response, you said that there's approximately 83 positions now vacant. And, and it's almost 20, 25% of the total staff in 2018. And, and 30, 30, 30 of them are CNAs. Uh, but then again, we do have a census of 200 versus 250, so I do average that out. Even though I have 30 CNA openings, 
I have 50 30. empty beds. I don't need 30 CNAs if my census is going to be 200, but I could use 15 more. So Not 30 more, but I could use 15 more. So you run the nursing home with with overtime and with temps? We have very few temps, and by the first of the year, we're doing away with them because they're giving us like probably maybe 150 hours a week. If that temp, it's, it's, just, it's just a waste of our time dealing with them. Okay. So we're going back to the old system that we had, and which seemed to have worked better. So we put all the money back into the budget, back into the lines, and we're going to continue to try to recruit people to work in the nursing home. Um, Ray, can, Paul, do you mind waiting a second? Uh, oh, sure. Let him ask the first question. You still had that question? I think so. You're forgetting. Remember who it was? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 30 minutes ago, but yeah. sorry. Um, it, it, it's good timing, I guess. It's specific to the CNAs, I thought maybe nine to 12 months ago, we were talking about a partnership with me. I think it was Mildred Ellie, and sure. I don't know if that's in place now, and if it is, how many CNAs can we expect out of that program annually? Is it an annual program we're gonna be putting? Uh, it's not, I, I, you know, it's more than an annual uh, year of training, but uh, if it's a recurring program, we can annually keep it. <coughs> yeah, we, we are in partnership with Mildred Ellie. All the papers have been signed. These are the issues, okay? Mildred Ellie in the first class, uh, we had six people, and it's virtually every two to three months we could have another class, or we could have classes run simultaneously, but it takes around three months to get someone on board working for us. So in the first class, we had five people. Today, only two are working for us. Uh, we didn't pay, and by the way, we haven't paid Milford Ellie any money yet because the agreement with Milford Ellie is they have to work there a certain amount of months before we even pay them. So right now, out of the first class, we only have two people working for us. The second class, we had eight <coughs> candidates. Two left before the class started. Three left during the class, okay, and it left three. We're hoping to get two of those three, which would be a total of four over, over a six-month period. And so once they come out of the program, how long are they locked? I believe they're locked into two years. work? Two years for Albany County? Okay. And it's... it's it's really not working, in all honesty, you know, um, it's not working. So, and it may not be working because of the school that agreed to do this with us. So we are actually setting up a meeting over the next two weeks with them to see if we can figure out a way to get this done with them because our agreement is with them. But if it doesn't, then we're going to reach out to other schools like BOCES and other schools that maybe will have better candidates for us that will make this clear. This is why it's good we have the chair of the personnel committee here and Ray, we have the chair of the elder care committee wanted to make work with you over the course of the year to try to get ahead of this because we know the problem is yes. coming, right? Well, um, we, members of the committee who have questions are Paul, anybody else? In, and I have, you have a question, Sam, back there? And Doug will have a question. So go ahead. Um, we've been talking about the expenditure side and staff just want to go back to the revenue side for a second. Uh, based on what you, 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 you've said, let me see if I understand this. The Medicare and the Medicaid rates are set in statute, right? Pretty much be, based on the variables that you have yeah, for the, the nursing home, the use. methodologies that they use. So when people make a decision, uh, I don't want to say it's not their money, but it's uh, a progr programmatic funds so they're making a decision based on quality of care and, and what, the, what the place looks like, which is where you think we're going. On the private pay side, how do we compare in, how do you structure price? And how do we compare with the Daughters of Sarah and the Theresian houses of this world? Because those people, it would seem to me uh, also they are maybe using their own money. And if it's going to last 14 months instead of 10 months, there may be a, a decision for them to make. How does, how does the attraction for private pay work with pricing at a facility such as this? Well, number, number one, we have lower rates than Daughters of Sarah and Theresian House for sure. But they're much more than probably around hundred dollars a day lower. Okay. You could never charge a private resident, of course, lower, not of course, but lower than the Medicaid 
rate because right. they pay a last resort. The way you traditionally will establish the private rate is based on your Medicare rate. So if you look at your average Medicare rate, let's say it's $450 a day as an example, and Medicaid is $350, you'll probably set your private rate at $500, somewhere above the Medicare rate traditionally. Okay. And there's no rule to follow. It's what the market will bear. Uh, unfortunately, the well, way our system works for those that have dollars, if you have them, you use them up until you go on Medicaid. Some people <coughs> will never go on Medicaid um, using their, their assets. But um, it's based on really just what the market will bear. Okay. But, but you're telling me that people, because of our rate, can see an advantage of going to Albany County rather than one of the others. There's no doubt. That's why I believe we probably have the amount of private pays that we have, number one. And in addition, I don't know that there's any nursing home in our area that has more managed care contracts than us because we're able to negotiate a rate with the VA and with other managed care companies such as uh, Optum and others. Uh, which is United Healthcare, uh, where we get almost all of their people because our rate is so significantly lower than the other nursing homes and it's based on the Medicaid rate. So they'll pay us equal to our Medicaid rate or $10 more on, over our Medicaid rate, which traditionally is based on cost, uh, not anymore, but because we get IGT, that's okay. true. Uh, and that's how it's established. So, so rolling up all those individual payments to the aggregate, um, in 2017, I think our revenue was 26 and a half million, roughly, and now you're projecting uh, 34 million for 2019. So it's about seven and a half million increase over two years, 28 percent increase. So part of that is based on IGT. Part of that, right, we'll get to that. Yeah, right. part of that is based on the fact that we now have our receivables under control. And we're able to. But I thought the IGT has been roughly nine million. Around nine so point. Right now it's nine point four million. Seven to nine. This last, this last one was around nine. Yeah, around nine point four million. So, so, so that's not happened, really that's happens, not really explaining. But, that, but I'm going to tell you what happens. Hopefully, it's something else you're going to tell me. Well, that, that well, this is what happens when bed census goes up. Yeah. Everything generates in a nursing home or bed census. Right. And so does IGT. But, but our bed census seems to be down. And that's why so IG IGT, flat. That's so why IGT became flat. What happens is if we can increase our bed days, our Medicaid bed days. So you know, IGT is Medicaid bed days. If you increase the Medicaid bed days, let's say by those 30 residents, so it's 30 times 365. If you're able to average that, you're going to increase probably our IGT, where instead of 9.6 or 8 million, which has been probably over 10 million, based on Medicaid days. So 2019, you're expecting the IGT. We're expecting uh, that, that we're going to get IGT, more IGT. If we can fill our beds, everything's based on getting the nursing home complete and filling the beds. Without the beds being filled, then there are always going to be issues that you're working on decreasing expense to cover what you need to cover to pay your bills and you don't so, want to be there. For the benefit of myself and the other members, can you in layman's term explain the IGT to us again? What's going on there with the state? We transfer. Well, all right, I'll. Where, and then where it comes from, when we get it, when we receive it, where does it show up in our budget? It's not showing up in the nursing home. Well, I'll let Sean explain that. The payment back. The payment, the payment back. So the way IGT so we pay, yeah. So we'll do it. I'll try to maybe give it a little simple. Um, so very simple. Very simple. You have a pool of money set aside for IGT. It is shared by governmental transfer. Yes. yes. So the governments were transferring between our the county and the state of New York. Yes. Just and the yes. the county and state. The feds aren't involved. In this. Yes. Money comes from the feds. To the state. Okay. The state is part of the is part of the part of money. Yeah, but the, it's, a med, it's, a, it's related to Medicaid. You were saying that before. See, yeah. If we raise the bed sense of Medicaid, the IGT, it's going to go up. Well, what happens is this. The federal government will take care of all government entities through an IGT payment because they believe, because of the mission of government entities, 
they need different type of support beyond the normal reimbursement they created the IGT system, especially hospitals. So the feds, okay, will give X number of dollars to the state. They have certain obligations in order to get that money. After they receive that money and CMS approves it, and it's a specific dollar amount, they Center divide for it up. CMS is a federal they term. They divide it up Center based on, for nursing homes, yes, based on their Medicaid days. Yes. That's CMS. So, so. <coughs> CMS. Center for that's, the, that's, that's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. That, federal, that, that's the that's feds. So, so that dollar amount is put into, we'll say, a, a pie, and you get your slice of that pie based on how many Medicaid days you provide. At our nursing home, how many Medicaid days we provide at our nursing home is going to result in a state. Well, it's every nursing home gets Medicaid days. Okay. That gets divided up, and then you get your apportionment. Now, if more people leave, and that's why we got an even bigger windfall. The last couple of years, I think, two years ago. If people leave that pool, they don't get their piece of the pie, so to speak, because they're not generating any issues. But even though the, the money stays the same. Like the, the, the government entities that were sold in nursing homes, every time they sold a nursing home to a proprietary or not for profit, your IGT went up. Because their Medicaid days were taken out of the system. Right. And it was more of the pool money. Your, your Medicaid days stayed the same, but there's more pool money. But you were just saying before, we really want Medicare days, not Medicaid days, because Medicare pays more. Correct. Okay. That is true. Right? So, if, right. so hey. that's that's the challenge, and that's running a nursing home. So It's 100% true that if you can admit a Medicare resident and keep a Medicare census of 20% as an example versus 10%, <laughs> you're going to pay What's the ideal number of Medicare days? Well, I can't tell you days, I can tell you percentage. Okay, 20, mm -hmm. 20. 20 would be great. You're not allowed to go over 25. Because <clears throat> when you're receiving the money that we're receiving from reimbursement from the CON, you had to sign a document that you had to maintain a census. 75% Medicaid residents in your building. So that could also be managed okay. Medicaid Medicaid. 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 Are we at that ideal number? Oh, no. no. We're not even close. <laughs> and that's why there's so much room for us to grow. We're, we're, we're holding our own, mainly because of the IGT. So, so just, Sean, where does, where does the money show up in the budget, the IGT? You get your revenue in where? the nursing home. Out of MMIS 6100, the payment goes out. Medicaid Management Information System? MMIS? MMIS. That's your Medicaid loan. On the revenue side? <clears throat> On the expense side. And it comes out of social services. So that's the money we, well, we're sending money to the state, right. and then we're getting money back from We the have state. to give them half, and then they give us the whole thing. And why are we giving them half? So they can maximize what? As, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, this is getting really perverse. Um, so the deal is, is that you have to put what we send to the state. What we send to the state is under MMIS. Yes. And where does it come back in? Revenue in the nursing home. It's it's in the nursing home, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Got it. Okay. Yes. We're good. Doug, you want to ask about energy? Yes. How do you know? Uh, um, the 2019-23 capital plan we approved. What? How much? Four million dollars. Yeah. For energy upgrades. Yeah, Larry, the uh, feasibility study came back. And yes. You know, we saw it. And, and I, I think it, it would really help in terms of uh, attracting people there, especially the uh, solar carport for the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, like the and it would touch your electric bill. I mean, I looked at your national grid bill, it's like 7000 8000 a month. You could cut, they, they said you could cut that significantly, but I think it could do more. Would that help you with your marketing? And getting people into the nursing home. Well, I think every way helps. You know, if this help you build downside, something's positive. Whether it's helping the environment or lowering our electric bill, we clearly have to study. They're already uh, drawing up plans of where they believe the solar panels can go. 
by the goes, but that's, that is being done as we speak. And we have other energy efficiencies going into it. I mean, even our windows are going to be energy efficient. Our boilers will now be energy efficient. Our air conditioning system will be energy efficient. So but we are taking that study extremely seriously, because we know how important it is to the ledge. And they're picking out now places, including some of carports, where that uh, solar power hopefully will be going. Because your parking lot is Right, so we're still not sure where the solar panels are going, whether it's in the parking lot. They have a plan of where they're going to recommend them, and then they'll be presented in some format. Okay, a uh, question from the chair of the Social Services Committee, Sam Fine. Right here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that registered nurses are also paid below the regional average, and I'm wondering if there's a plan to increase the uh, salaries for registered nurses, I understand it's also probably part of union negotiations. Also, I want to ask about um, the CNAs that you were talking about. Obviously, uh, with all the vacancies, that's one reason to raise the salaries, but it's also concerning that they only make, they start at 24,000. I mean, that seems pretty low for the difficult work that I'm sure that they're doing. And I know that some of them came into the legislative meeting. They didn't speak publicly about it, but they mentioned to some legislators. I think it was a salary issue. Um, and then also the environmental services uh, needs also. It looks like they started to <coughs> Can you speak a little bit about uh, that position as well? Okay, so uh, it's a little hard with it. Do you like to pay for that? If you need to so, uh, repeat anything. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, the first answer, uh, well, I'll, I'll try to answer all of them, but not necessarily in the order. We, in management, and I think everyone in this room agrees that certified nursing assistants should make more than our starting salary, $24,000. And so do I. So does 1199 SEIU. And they're totally behind the agenda of increasing that and taking care of that. This is an internal issue with existing staff who are new versus staff who have been there for four years and have a revenue that is much greater than the starting salary. And we somehow have to make those two ends meet. We're working on it. I'm confident that eventually we'll meet somewhere in the middle and everyone hopefully will be happy. Now, the issue is, does it help? You know, just because you increase something from 24,000 to 27,000, which is the mean in our area, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be blocking to our nursing home. What it means for me is I believe we'll be able to retain staff and then hopefully recruit staff with a new nursing home and a better base of salary. Retention is where we lose all of our new people. No one stays. They start at 24,000. They get a little bit of experience. They can get a job across the street at 27,000 and they leave. We have almost 100% turnover rate. So that is one of the issues that I think will help. It's going to definitely help with retention. Because with our base salary that's equal to the community and with our health and pension now, you put all of those together, now it's a little bit more difficult for someone to say I'm leaving. So the second, an the second uh, answer to the RNs, I don't think we can do it all at once. We have an issue with RNs. It's not a horrible issue because we have our RN supervisors who are paying ex extremely well and they're very stable. At some point in time, we need to fill those positions, but it's not a run to our head today because we're at 200. And as far as environmental people are concerned in that department, I think all of those staff members are industry norm and they're earning what they should be earning according to other nursing homes and what they're paying, especially when you look at our benefit package. So on October 30th, <coughs> Auditor Finance with personnel is going to have a meeting discussing workforce issues for the county. Recruitment, retention, in-county residents, out of, you know, all, all those issues. We're going to try to start taking a look at some of those things, how they affect 2019 budget and right. beyond, right? Um, so back on the energy thing here, we, pre-28 in the capital plan, we had already approved $11 million pre-2018. We just did another $4 million. So how much is that, of that's going to, ha, has any of that $11 million been spent, Sean, and, and are we, are we gonna, where are we going to be at the end of 2019? Can I just ask you to repeat the first that? They're really going over here. <laughs> 2019. 
how much are we going to spend out of from the, on the capital plan the total 15 million dollars so out of just the energy efficiency section there's 11 yes. right 11 million and 4 million two numbers or total, total of 15 yes uh, I believe that encompasses a lot of your infrastructures um, so that's going to the majority of that you know your windows a big chunk of that you know your boiler system is going to be a big chunk of that because you're still operating boilers from 1972 um, you know, they've been retubed and upgraded but you know <laughs> and, and and the lighting throughout the house is still you know so all that Larry was just saying is going to be done all of that's going to be done. Right. It's, it's all going to be, you know, it goes in your staging. You know, the first part is going to be the DNF section. That, of course, would have your, your lights and your windows and, and done at that rate. The basement, I believe, comes after that. So the basement's going to include your boiler plant, which is a, is a big part. The basement the was supposed to be done by July next year. The basement, they won't start the basement and the kitchen. We're going to go. We're going to empty everyone out, so they'll have it to do as quickly as they can. Probably sometime March, April, as soon as the weather clears. It's a very cold winter. 2019. 2019, correct? Yeah. So when they start the base, which should be somewhere between March or April, depending on weather. That's my understanding from a contractor: a nine-month to ten-month project to do the base. So the they boilers like, are expensive, so that's in 2019. Boilers are expensive, and you like to do them in the summertime when you don't need them. Right? <laughs> so, so. They're going to start as but quickly as they can and finish before the winter. But none of this addresses <coughs> the national the electricity <coughs> issue per se. Well, lighting does. The lighting would be a lighting would be reduced. I don't know if you were looking at all utilities or just you know, because. You know, well, we're not just talking generating; we're talking saving the use of it. Right? So yeah, you, you would be starting to see some of that take effect next year. With the completion of the full facility, when you you start renovating, that's when they're going to go through you. all of your lighting, all of your. Uh, so what's the number out of the 15? How much is going to be spent in 2019? We're we're at the state well over half of that. Just well over half. That. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from members of the? Yeah, go. I first wanted, John, huh? in terms of uh, the the salaries that we pay. How does that equate to minimum wage? How does that equate? Uh, well, you know, as minimum wage creeps up here, the lower tier, uh, CNAs, the housekeepers, you are starting to encroach on their salary. They're still above it. They're still above the, 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 uh, the law. And they will be until at least the end or close to close to the 2021, I think it goes out to. I think up to 1250. The biggest problem with that, and I think I may have mentioned this at a previous meeting, is everyone else who has to raise their salaries to the minimum wage. And as close as we are to the minimum wage, what would you rather do? You could go and work in Bed Bath and Beyond for fourteen dollars an hour or come and be a CNA for twelve fifty. What you gonna do? And then you will find that people are not coming healthcare industry, long-term care industry, all right, because of that, do a job that is less strenuous than, you know, what they have to do every day, and I, and I have taught our staff, I mean, they're unbelievable at what they do every day, they really are dedicated and sincere, and that's why somehow or another we need to bridge the staff and, and fix what's broken. Seems like it's about 1450 an hour. Chris, did, did you get your report? I'm all set. Oh, thank you. Okay. You all set? You all yep. set? Anybody else have a question? Anything you want to say to wrap up? Well, I appreciate, in all honesty, uh, everything that everyone has uh, done for me since I've been here and the continued faith in what we're doing at the nursing home. We have a phenomenal team. Know, here putting everything together, Sean and others support back there, uh, the people of uh, the county executive's office, and, and we couldn't do it without the legislature. So um, I just thank you for 
for having faith. Well, I'm glad we're able to have you here alone tonight. Just focus on on the nursing home. Is that that important to us? Well, I appreciate that too. And even though, as you know, I'm not the biggest proponent of doing it because of all the issues you raised. I know, you know? but I, I'm glad you're confident. I'm not going to make it say. I, let's wait and see what happens. I believe in this project. I've always believed in this project once we started it. Um, I think that everything that we're putting forward today and the things that we're asking of you are going to come to where they need to be. And it's a, it's a process and it's going to happen. And I thank so, you for Larry, we will probably be following up with some maybe written, additional written questions where we appreciate your being available for those. And also, next year, I'm going to make the announcement right now, we're having this budget review meeting at the nursing home. I hope so. Thanks. Ooh. Right? You said that educational wing is going to be done, right? Right. Have to be quiet. Motion to adjourn.